The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the book of Ecclesiastes. The lectionary has chopped this up a bit for us, but I think it's mostly to make sure we don't fall asleep during the reading. But Ecclesiastes will be in chapter 1, read verse 2, then down verse 12 through 14, then over to chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see, all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they'll be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we gather this morning around these words of Scripture, surely on our minds are those in places like El Paso who this morning worship in the wake of tragedy. Lord, our hearts and our prayers, our minds, our actions, our hands and feet are united with them in praying for your kingdom to come. But Lord, as we tarry on, we come to times like these when we listen for your Holy Spirit. We listen for words from Scripture. And so now, Lord, we pray as we've gathered together that you give us ears to hear your words, not mine. Ears to hear words that call us to do what it is you would have us to do. So, Lord, we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You ever get in your car and you catch the end of something on the radio you wish you had heard the whole of? That happened to me this week. There was a a radio show on uh, about Americans living in Paris. They had been living there for some time. The person interviewing one of the the people there said, what's so different? Why did you move here? And she said, oh, it was all about, you know, when I was a kid, Paris, saw the Eiffel Tower, bicycles, berets. That was back before cigarettes killed everybody, you know, that kind of thing. And she said, when I got here, I realized Paris is just like anywhere else. And it kind of smells bad. That's my editorial comment. Paris does kind of smell bad. Uh, But she said, there's one big thing that's different about the Parisians, you see. She said, in America, uh, we look at food as medicine or fuel. Uh, This is why some of us eat stuff like kale. What what in the world? I mean, eat turnip greens. Don't eat kale. But she said, the Parisians laugh at this. This is why French food is so rich. They, They seek the pleasure in the ordinary ways of life. When I heard that, I thought about Paula. Some of you have met Paula, my, my late stepmother. She came here about two years ago to our Christmas cantata. She was here not because uh, she and my dad are necessarily fans of Christmas cantatas, uh, but because my, Paula had booked a surprise trip for my dad to Las Vegas. And they needed somebody to drive them to the Birmingham airport. And Paula was already in a wheelchair she had already lost 100 pounds. 
in a matter of a few months. And her days were literally numbered. But she had decided that she was going to take my dad, who never went anywhere, to Las Vegas. I remember the whole ride over there, Dad said, as he was chain smoking with the window cracked, I haven't flown on a plane since the 70s. He told me that several times, told every person at the Birmingham airport that. With his arms up, dropping his bags a few times, I'm like, Dad, they'll arrest you for this kind of behavior. My stepmom was already in her power chair. She rode up. They asked her what kind of battery, and she panicked. I don't know. I don't know. It's fine, ma'am. It's fine. And they looked like two, two lost puppies as they went through security, looking over their shoulder at me to make sure every... I felt like I was watching my kids get on a plane, not my parents. They went, and, and when they came back, I picked them up at the airport. Their suitcase had exploded, and they mailed all their stuff back. And as soon as we got there, first thing Dad asked was, where's the smoking section at the airport? We got in the car, and they began to tell me all the things that they had done. Paula, even in her wheelchair, had ziplined. Dad did not. He used some words about why he did not. They rode in a gondola. And yeah, they went to a few casinos, they saw some shows, and all in all had a good time. Paula died four or five months later. She didn't let the end of her life dictate, oh, well, it's all just vanity, it's all just, oh, we got it, it's all going to fade away. I think it's fitting that on today, the Sunday before school starts, when we recognize teachers, that we hear from Koholeth. The teacher. Tradition tells us it's Solomon. I don't have any quarrel with that. You read the book of Proverbs, and man, he reads like just great things you put on bumper stickers, nice little things you could put on, you know, on, on throw pillows or hang in your bathroom somewhere, right? And then you get to Ecclesiastes, and we go from the, the, the proverbial wisdom of Solomon and David to what sounds like the depressing journal of a king who realizes it's all for naught. Vanity of vanities, Koholeth says. The teacher, Solomon, lives a life in pursuit of wisdom, and there at the end he sits down to write and says, I discovered it's all for naught. Now I suppose if you read it just on the surface that way, you might just close your Bible and walk home with a fatalistic attitude. Well, it doesn't matter what we do. The world keeps on spinning and one day we might fall into the sun and the sun will go out and we'll freeze to death. But I don't think that's the reason he writes. In fact, I read this almost like a father giving his son advice. Don't waste your life in the rhythm of get up, go to work, come home, go to bed, get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. But like those Parisians who find the joy and rich food that might wind up clogging their arteries. We live our lives looking for the good right in front of us. That a life of faith seeks purpose, joy, hope, even in the midst of apparent meaninglessness. But you've got to have the right perspective. And without the proper perspective, life feels like that meaningless cycle of ebb and flow, the ebb and flow of time. I thought about my own teachers recently, and I could go back and tell you every one of them that have had some indelible mark on my life, but there were definitely two who did. My ninth grade geometry teacher, Miss Lawrence. Miss Lawrence, uh, in the ninth grade in our English class, we had to make these little cards that were going on the front bulletin board in what we called Old Junior. You can't find it now. It's gone. They raised it to the ground uh, in Enterprise. Big bulletin board right there when you walked in. We had to make little note cards. Uh, it sounded so childish when I started thinking about it, of what we wanted to be when we grew up. We had to bring items from home to glue onto those cards, and they'd staple them on the board at the front of the school. And I had brought home some loose screws and nuts and uh, glued them to the purple purple piece of index card and wrote on there, I want to be a mechanic, maybe a good one. And they stapled it to the poster board. I turned my, my test into Miss Lawrence. Now there's something you have to know, and I'm not telling you this to brag, I'm just telling you because it's true. From the ninth grade 
until I was in Cal 2 in junior college, I never missed a math problem on a test. And so when I turned mine in to Miss Lawrence, she would always joke and say, here's the answer key. But one day she grabbed my, my hand and said, Chris, I, I read your thing on the board. And why do you want to be a mechanic? Now, there's nothing wrong with being a mechanic. Why do you want to be a mechanic? I said, Miss Lawrence, there's nothing else I know how to do. This is what my people do. This is what, what I've been trained and taught how to do by my uncles and my stepdad. It's just the thing my people do. And she said, well, you need to broaden your perspective. Think more. There are other opportunities out there, and if that's what you want to be, that's great. But you have a lot of potential. The other teacher was Mr. Graves, my ninth and 10th grade co-op teacher, eventually became the assistant principal at Enterprise. One day, Mr. Graves said the same thing, pulls me aside and says, son, I don't want to tell you what to do with your life, but you could do a whole lot more than this. I was working at the Chevy dealership at the time, just sweeping the floor. That's all they let me do. And I figured that's what I'd go on doing as long as I had to do it. But I remember even giving in at that time to that feeling of, of nihilism, of fatalism, that it's just this ebb and flow, ebb and flow. I went through it when I was 16, like we all do. You want a car? I asked my dad, Dad, can I have a car? He said, well, you got to get a job. I said, how am I going to get to the job? Well, you better get a car. How do I get the car? Well, you got to get the job. Just a snake eating its tail, the ebb and flow of time. I remember it dawning on me even more when I went with Paula to Walmart. That's where you go to get everything in town to get my dad a Father's Day gift. We walked through the sliding glass doors and Paul said, what do you want to get your dad? I said, I don't know. I don't know what he does. She looked at me and she said, you know what? I don't either. My dad and my grandma were the same way. The ebb and flow. Get up, go to work, come home, go to bed, get up, go to work, go home, come to bed. Life slips away from you that way. Koholeth says, vanity of vanity. All is vanity. I, when I was king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. And what's the conclusion he comes to? It's an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. Well, that's not real encouraging. But I can't help but wonder if what Solomon meant was he looked out and he saw all these folks toiling. Get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. Get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. The ebb and flow of time being the master of us all. And saying, I see what we all do the purpose of every person, and it just seems like vanity. All the deeds under the sun, vanity, chasing after wind. I suppose if one gives in to the temptation to simply observe life through the lens of self-preservation and mere existence, the world can seem meaningless. I'm just here to carry on. I'm just here to get up. I suppose if Paula had, had imagined in her mind that really every morning is just about making sure you had the next morning, not booking wild trips to Vegas, it could seem meaningless. Like we're all just running on the hamster wheel until we keel over. But there's more to it than that. Of course, some see the purpose of their lives as building something to hand on to others, and there's nothing really wrong with that. So long as we remember that a life of faith lived in the present trusts God with the future. Isn't that the point of the parable we read earlier in the service? When a man comes to Jesus, tell my brother to come off the inheritance. And Jesus says, well, there was a man whose crop did really well, built bigger barns. But God came to him that night and required his life. I put it off. What are you doing? This is what Solomon is toiling with here. Verse 18, he says, I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. I don't think he read this to his sons at night. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish, that they will be master of all for which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. 
Even Solomon recognizes that just to leave it behind to someone else, who knows how, if they'll even use it the right way, who knows? So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes, he says, one who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. I think Solomon had a bad day when he wrote Ecclesiastes. But I also think he came to realize that building an empire, a kingdom, to pass on was futile. Especially given the nature of Israel in the wake of Solomon's death. We talked about this on Wednesday night, just looking over the kings. After Solomon died, his two sons, Jeru- uh, excuse me, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, split the kingdom. Never came back together again. All that Solomon had worked for built up Israel into this grand nation state in the ancient world. And Solomon dies and his sons split it and squander it. I think he came to realize that. That building something to leave behind, just building a legacy, while it can be a worthwhile thing, when it becomes our only focus, the future. Trying to shape it ourselves, trying to keep our hands on it, trying to make it what we want it to be. When we're only focused on that, we can lose sight of what God has for us right here and right now. Because you see, a life of faith rests in the presence of God, here and now. Trusting God to work all things for the good of those who love Him. And I don't know of a harder lesson in this life to learn. I can look back on it now, some 17 years later. But when I was 18... I really thought my life was over. I had everything laid out. The job I was going to have, the the school where I was going to go, everything. And just like that, it was gone. Came into work, said, oh, Chris, you don't work here anymore. You've worked yourself out of a job. Everything, the whole house of cards came down. I was up at night, couldn't sleep. 18 years old. Worrying about what's it going to be like when I'm 19, when I'm 20. Got a job working for minimum wage, then was 5.15 an hour. Eventually got a raise to 6.50 an hour. Changing oil, swapping belts on school buses. What is it going to be like when I'm 30? When I'm 35? I'd stay up at night counting my hairs on my head as if it mattered. But now... That's 17 years ago. Now, I look back and say, if I could go back and tell him, hey man, it all works out. This future thing, this isn't yours to control. This isn't yours to to manipulate and shape. The future belongs to the only one who knows it. To God. And here's Solomon. Here's Solomon thinking the same thing knowing his days are numbered, ask the question, what do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? I thought of some answers myself. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain? A hernia, probably. Maybe a bigger house. Maybe a nicer car. I thought about it when when Dad and I, after Paula died went to the the funeral home. Some of you have been there. You go in the back, and it's like a car showroom, right? Latest colors, latest models. And then we had to talk to the man who was going to bring the granite headstone, the curbing, bring all the the gravel in. That was the rule at the cemetery. had to be gravel. And you think about all the things you could get for a little bit more money. A more highly polished stone. One with your picture etched in it with a laser. Why, you can even get some now with a screen in them. Did you know that? You can get a headstone with a screen in it. And I don't know how the battery does on that, but you know, if you're planning now, you might want to consider. I don't know if you're an Android or Apple. I don't know which one it is. For a little bit more money. What 
Do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? It's as if Solomon said, the same gaping hole in the ground we all get. For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This is also vanity. I'm going to push back on Koholeth and Solomon. Because he might have found all things to be vanity, but I believe he meant that all things as the ultimate end are vanity. All things we seek to elevate as our ultimate goal and desire, apart from God, are vanity. Whether it's to build a nation of Israel, whether it's to build a grand legacy, whether it's to leave a higher, more highly polished headstone, it's all vanity. And that's why, that's why we look for the good that God has for us now. One can read the words of Koholeth as fatalistic, believing that life is meaningless, our pursuits are futile. But a life of faith calls us to more than that. A life of faith points towards trust in a God who is present with us here and now and guides the course of our future so long as we're willing to trust Him. And should you choose to live your life for, for your own sake, to simply leave behind a legacy, it will in the end, I believe He's right, feel like we're just building bigger barns to store a harvest we'll never use. But should you choose to find the good in each day, the Christ in each person, the hope in every circumstance, then you'll begin to live into the fullness of a life of faith. And then it won't be vanity anymore. For then all that's left and all that's worthwhile is Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, help us to learn the hard lesson Solomon learned. That, Lord, to pursue anything in this life but you is vanity. Just chasing after the wind. For in the end, Lord, we all wind up in the same place. So, Lord, help us to understand that the only pursuit is you the love of God, bringing your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So Holy Spirit, be with us now in this time as we listen. Speak to us. Show us, Lord, what vanities we must lay aside, even now, to pursue you and all that you have for us in this moment, in this present time, in your presence among us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.